Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, it's great to see that there's a lot of people here. Um, so that's kind of nerve-wracking, but we can't see you any because of the light. Uh, at any rate, um, so this is things we've learned. Uh, Atomic Dust tries to do this uh, usually once every quarter. We've been a little bit slow this year, but we try to do this. And, and the reason that we have these sorts of talks is because uh, we've been doing this for a long time. Atomic Dust uh, will be 15 in January. Yay! And uh, <clears throat> we've seen a lot of stuff. We've done a lot of things. We've learned a lot of things over the years. And as we sort of have these new ideas and new experiences, we try to put together some things that will not only help us be better, but that we can hopefully talk about to you know, help other people um, do their jobs better or maybe come to a different understanding of things. So the topic that we're on today is competition and positioning. And we've kind of framed this around how companies can be more competitive uh, with what they already have. Uh, so one thing I want to point out before we get into this is that I'm not very good with a microphone. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, is that one of the things we're going to talk about quite a bit is um, design, which I think is an interesting thing uh, to throw into the conversation with competition and positioning because not a lot of people see the connection there. Um, so we're going to try to, to draw some connections through this. We're going to try to talk about how a lot of these things are related. And uh, we're going to highlight a handful of thought leaders in our industry and th from some other industries, go through a couple of case studies and hopefully just kind of share some perspective um, that we've learned about competition, positioning, and then the role that can design, the design can play uh, in all of that. So with that, here's Mike. Hi. So there's, there's also jokes along the way. Uh, so this whole story kind of starts, let me see if I could figure out how to do this, uh, with a nervous breakdown I had. It wasn't like, it's sort of dramatic, but if you know me, I, you know I'm kind of dramatic. Uh, it wasn't really a nervous breakdown, but we are a design firm, and uh, just like any other design firm, we enter award shows and we get try to get work in shows and press and stuff like that. And uh, earlier this year, we were lucky enough to be featured in the AIGA, which is the Professional Organization for Design, uh, their 20s show, which is just like this gallery show, and just being in the gallery is the award, and it was really cool. And I think this year, we had seven pieces in. And that was great, and we were really excited about that. But the year before, I think we had nine. And so I was wondering, are we slipping? And then next year, if we don't get eight, does that mean we're, we're doing worse? Or what if we don't get any? You know, does that mean we've just kind of fallen off? So it's like, what is success for a design firm? <clears throat> There's this blog in St. Louis called the St. Louis Egotist that sort of provides critique and review of uh, design work coming out of the city. And it's all anonymous. No one knows who runs it. It's really not me, although I talk about it. We know. I know. It's <laughs> Kevin Kelly. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so they were cool enough to run this feature about uh, all the firms in the city with all this awesome work and uh, you know, to kind of you know, promote design in our city. And then there's this comment uh, that, I, that is anonymous. And I'm just going to read it. So. <clears throat> Wow, a collection of beautiful yet useless stuff, aside from a few pieces by the Tremendousness, which is a tremendously collective, uh, awesome firm. They do a lot of like business infographic style stuff. And can Atomic Dust design a logo without using fractal type geometric shapes? <laughs> I mean, that's harsh. Uh, so anyway, the, the last part I think is kind of funny, but the first part, the idea that design is beautiful and, and yet useless that every year all these design firms are going to make all this stuff to be in a show that's all just thrown away, so make more next year to be in this show, and, and sort of where does it all go? And so we've been asking ourselves, how can we make design more useful? Well, there's a lot of junk mail in the world. There's a lot of uh, terrible web templates. Uh, there's a lot of just fluffy design for design sake pieces, and a lot of, a lot of design isn't that useful. And so we try to think, like, why do people hire design firms? And usually it's for things like websites or brochures or logos or emails or campaigns or sales promotion or something like that. Uh, people always feel they need a new website or a brand or sales materials. Uh, there's never like this, we have to have it unless there's like an acquisition or a new product. But it's usually like this, this feeling that they, that they have. Uh, and when we ask, they say, well, it's dated, or it's old, or it just isn't us anymore. And I think this applies to a lot of brands, but this is also, uh, this is what my wife would say about me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. You know, some things are just dated and old and, and not people anymore, or not re reflective anymore. But I think the underlying reason people work with design firms is for competition. Um, they want to be, you know, they want to stay relevant, they want to... Uh, 
show that they're awesome. They want to be in front of the market. Uh, in 1994, there were 2,738 uh, websites in the world, and AtomicDust.com was one of them. Uh, thanks, James, wherever you are. Uh, and in 2015, there's over a billion, and I'm sure this number will probably just grow, uh, which is crazy, but there's more products and more services and, and more companies than ever before. It's moving faster than any one brand, uh, which means that while you're working on your brand or your product or trying to innovate and, and make new, uh, make something better, someone's out there working to make you obsolete. <clears throat> So there's new companies, new products, new technology, and there's less attention on the existing ones. And so people work with firms to be more competitive. So to me, more useful design would be design that would make brands more competitive. So today, we're going to talk about competition and positioning in culture, right? And this is the most boring business chart I could come up with. <laughs> because, you know, some of these topics, <clears throat> they're not that exciting. Uh, and these are all sort of long-term things <clears throat> to be sort of more competitive in business. But nobody, nobody really wants to hear it, right? They want to say that, oh, what you should talk about is that one thing you could do on your website to like crush your competitor, or here's the strategy for trying to get all the, the sales leads. And nobody wants to hear about this sort of investment in time. And I really blame the 1980s for it. <laughs> this is actually a picture of Jesse getting ready this morning. It's my gig at the bus really, stop. Really good. That's great. That does look like me. I know, kind of. <laughs> anyway, I blame the 80s. Uh, oh, Jeremy Corey's here. So, uh, in the 80s, you, you had these, like, these legendary stories of how under uh, the worst you know, circumstances, you could still like, shoot one bullet and blow up the Death Star, right? And still, and still win. Or if you're familiar with Voltron, uh, you know, 28 minutes of every episode, Voltron was just getting defeated. And then he remembers, oh, I have this one magical weapon I could use to to turn it all around. Or uh, no matter how bad you are at karate or painting a fence, there's this one thing you can do to, uh, to crush your competition. He really didn't see that coming. I mean, okay. <laughs> so it's this idea that there's, there, there's this magic bullet in marketing, and there's this idea that there's one thing I can do to just jump ahead from my competitors and kill them. Uh, so a lot of people you know, say it's a new website or a new logo or a new uh, identity or, or something like that. But really, we call it magic bullets. <clears throat> so magic bullets are great, and you can have, they can have an impact, and new websites and new designs uh, can, can move the needle. But the trick is, is that they're not very, they don't last very long. With more competitors and the market moving so quick, uh, websites, I think, uh, in design is based on trends, and those trends change so quickly uh, that they become sort of obsolete. And so, Design alone, or magic bullets alone, is not a very, it's not a long-term strategy. <clears throat> it's not really a strategy at all, it's more of a tactic. But a lot of businesses turn to these things to try to be more competitive, and it makes sense. But when you think about strategy, there's this guy named Michael Porter who works for the Harvard Business School. Okay, so strategy explains how an organization faced with competition will achieve superior performance. And so Michael Porter, uh, he's written a couple books and papers, and he works at Harvard, so everyone assumes he's qualified. Uh, but it's this, it's this idea that there's this battle to be the best, right? I want to be the best uh, plumber I can be, or I want to be the best graphic designer I can be, or I want to be the best lawyer, the best uh, broker, the best whatever. And it's sort of uh, ingrained in our culture. And no one really knows what the best means. The best is a lot of times uh, not based on profit, but it's based on the idea of what people perceive the best is. And it's only really, it's, it's only based on comparing yourself to other people or comparing your company to another brand <coughs> or jetpacks. Uh, Porter says we can blame sports and that sports culture has sort of given us this idea that there's a clear winner and a clear second place and a clear third place. Uh, he says that if you're going to, play baseball, you want to be the best pitcher that's ever been, or the best quarterback, or the fastest track person, or the best foosball champion, I don't know. Uh, so it's this idea that, that sports culture has sort of gotten grained in business where we compare ourselves to other people. So it's the concept of if we win, they lose, or if, if I lose, that means they win. 
and it's this constant battle. Uh, but he says we have it all wrong, and that competition focuses more on serving customer needs than on destroying rivals, which I think is really kind of interesting, because in 15 years of business, we hardly ever get clients that come in that say, I want to make this thing that really adds value to customers. Or it's usually more about, I need to compete against this pe these people that have this new product, or uh, I want to you know, be more relevant, or, or you know, the other guy's lying, or, or something. But it's never really about serving customer needs. It's more focused on destroying rivals. Uh, for example, like what's the best hotel, right? There's probably- Taylor. What? Oh. It's four seasons, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the best hotel, you could say that there's, there's, you know, there's Yelp and there's TripAdvisor and everyone has their opinion and how they think what the best means. Uh, but really, if, what's the best hotel for an audience? So what's the best hotel for business travelers? Uh, or what's the best hotel for families? Or what's the best hotel in Kansas City that has a water slide? And there's actually a couple of them. Uh, so it's really this idea of, of how a brand can shape its activities towards uh, towards a target audience and not just everybody. So you should compete on being the best fit for your customers' needs. So if you have a, a hotel focused on business travelers, you need to say, well, what's important to them? So maybe there's, uh, there's in-house dry cleaning or shoe shining or quick breakfast or lots of cabs or whatever fits their needs the best. So you can be the best fit for that audience. Uh, it's the idea of value over volume. So Rather than trying to get all the customers in the world, you should just get the ones uh, that value uh, the services you offer or see the world the same way you do. And with that, you can charge a premium. Porter says, uh, that's Porter, that uh, the market can be explained by, or competition can be explained by being either the cheapest or the most unique. So if you're gonna be the cheapest, what you have to do is essentially figure out how to cut cost everywhere you can uh, in, in not spend money so you make more profit. Or you can be the most unique, which is a brand that kind of def defies the category and changes how people will compare you to the cheapest. Uh, he says, <coughs> oh, sorry. For example, Acer and Apple are two computer companies. I, I'm using Apple in a marketing presentation. I feel terrible. It's such a cliche. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, but everyone will get it. So Acer, these guys both make these boxes that fold in half, right? And in the boxes, you can send emails, or you can surf the web, or you can download images, or you can uh, write, you know, whatever, make websites. You can do all these th things with computers that are essentially the same kind of output. But how they get there is completely different. And Acer is the cost leader. So Acer sells laptops at Walmart for about 250 bucks, and they're great. And if you're looking for a low-cost laptop, it's a, it's a wonderful brand, and a lot of people are. <clears throat> Apple sells computers for 10 times that, the same exact sort of functions, but the way they do it in every way is so different that people can't really compare Apple to Acer, right? So the worst place you can be is the dreaded middle. Because it's easy, where, where it's these brands that, don't, that aren't really the cost leader and they're not unique. Uh, and it's, it's easy for me to compare Acer and Apple and everybody kind of gets that comparison, right? But if I said, okay, let's talk about uh, Gateway versus Lenovo. You know, and, and that's where sort of like this battle for bullet points, I think, lives in the world where people try to compare features and benefits and these one-off little, um, differences and uh, people battle for like price discounts or sales promotions. So it's hard to compare things when you're in the middle. So uh, Porter says you essentially shouldn't. And most businesses are very similar. This is Jesse and I getting ready right. today. <laughs> I'm uh, fresh pick. Yeah. Uh, so most businesses are very similar and a lot of places are just in the middle and everybody's battling to be the best. So, uh, to throw ourselves under the bus, I work at a company called Atomic Dust. You guys might have heard of it because you're here. Uh, so, here's a picture. This is my friend Katie and Adam. Hey, guys. Uh, so, we are a marketing company and design company in St. Louis. And in St. Louis, there are 120 plus agencies. And they range in all sizes and shapes. And some of them are awesome, and some of them are terrible. And, uh, well, it's true. Uh, there's a lot of great, there's awesome talent in St. Louis. Uh, but, you know, it's like we're one of 120, so, like, how do we do anything? So, we are not cheap, right? So, you could say, according to Porter, if we're going to be the market leader, we need to say, 
we're going to be the cheapest, so we're going to cut cost everywhere. So we'll send, we'll sell fifty dollar websites or templates, or we'll try to pay people less or have temp staff or any of that stuff. But we don't. That's not really our thing. Uh, so we could say, and all this is just in theory because this isn't really about atomic dust. But we could say, okay, well, let's look at these verticals. Like, what can we? If we're going to be unique, what can we specialize in? So maybe we could specialize in healthcare marketing or professional services or um, hospitality or brands focused around women. Uh, it, it maybe that's, that's like it would be a, a good fit for us. Uh, or maybe we could focus on just a, a horizontal where we only make websites or we only do branding or media buying or we make the best apps or uh, we do video production. And you know, the, all that stuff uh, we've done and it's, uh, you know, it's, I don't think we're excited about any of it. But the worst thing we can do is like never make any decision, right? It's just, because that way we can, you know, we don't know what we, what we do. <laughs> Right? There's no sort of defined parameters. So we just say yes to any work that comes in the door. Now, Atomic Dust really doesn't say yes to anything that comes in the door, but I want to use it a business as an example, so I'll just throw ourselves under the bus. So it's the idea that without any kind of focus, any, anything could be your client. So no focus really equals no strategy. And a company's activities are usually what makes it unique. So uh, Porter talks about this. Is this where you come in, Jess? Uh, oh, the We're ten dollar phrase. Companies' activities what makes it unique. So e everything that Mike's talked about up to this point, this whole trading space is strange. Uh, everything that Mike's talked about to this point is about uh, what Michael Porter says is important in identifying the things that makes your company different. And this sort of ten dollar phrase that we, you know, that he refers to as the value chain, uh, represents every single thing that happens, you know, from a prospective customer from the first contact they have with you till the time that you're done interacting with them, whether that's a you know, final transaction, whether it's a completion of a project, whatever it is, however, wherever the, the relationship terminates, is and all the steps that, that fall within that are the value chain. So the, the example that Mike just gave of atomic dust is that, you know, we could say, oh, well, we're not cheap, so that's, you know, we could build a positioning around that. We say, well, what does an expensive company to work with, who's an agency, need to do to be able to, to be expensive? You know, we could focus on vertical uh, markets. We could focus horizontally, whatever that is. We could also go and look through our, our value chain once we sort of understand where we do our best work, where we want to do that work, and then we can look at each step of the process and try to identify the unique things within that. So the idea is that you look for these differences and you essentially you highlight those. I mean, good positioning should amplify those differences in a good way. I mean, the things that you do throughout your entire process, throughout the activities that your company carries out or that your client carries out if you're on the agency side and you're doing this work for someone else, should be reflective of that the things that you do and the, and the people that you're trying to find a fit with. So we keep talking about this idea of a fit. And I think the, the interesting thing about Mike, Michael Porter and what Mike has talked about is that Again, a lot of times people look at competing with someone as crushing the competition versus identifying the people you want to work with, and I think just as importantly, the people you don't want to work with, to use that to really guide how you behave so that you can then do more for the people that you want to work with, add value to them throughout the process, and then be able to do all kinds of different things. One of the most important things is to be able to charge more for what you do for them. Uh, oh, we've got a little bit of a PDF issue. Um, so anyway, again, the competition is really a quest to identify the fit you want to find and then to try to find that fit and serve the people within it. It's melting. So again, you want the activities, you want the behaviors that happen within your company, the way that it interacts with clients, the way that people interact internally, et cetera, to be aligned with the fit that you're trying to find. And if you can do that, then... Hopefully, all those things make you unique. And once you're unique, unique, you're tougher to follow. So again, the idea of positioning and being more competitive is to sort of shift the comparison of apples to apples to um, apple to Acer. <laughs> this, you know, to, to, to oh, that's sort of, good. I, I, that's first I just thought that's of that. That's great. <laughs> We've been looking at this thing for two weeks, and it's the first time I thought of that. Um, at any rate, so we're going to get into that. That leads us into positioning, which is the next... Um, sort of author and the next subject I'm going to talk about. But real quick, let's take a look at an example. Um, we tried to pick out the most cliched examples we possibly could uh, to illustrate these things. We're going to use some real clients, and we might if it makes sense if they're here and can give us approval. 
but uh, we'll get to that when we need to. So let's look at Ikea versus Thomasville. Does everybody know who these companies are? Ikea put this giant, disgusting-looking blue box. I like it's it. Just, it's, you know, it's great. It's different. Um, and then Thomasville, is this, I think it's a store that our parents shop at. So, but but they both there's sell nothing furniture. Wrong with there's nothing wrong with that. They both sell furniture. You know, they're in the same category. But they don't, I don't think they feel that way. So, again, the example we're going to use with Michael Porter here, laser pointer, um, I just wanted to use that, is how companies uh, have chosen who they want to find a fit with, how they have made some compromises uh, in the way that they run their business in order to serve the needs of those people better. And in doing so, they've created a unique position for themselves within the market. We're going to look at a couple other specific types of examples as we move on. So IKEA primarily targeted at younger people, um, you know, whereas Thomasville may be more uh, established families and things like that. IKEA is cheap. Thomasville is not cheap. Uh, IKEA is a warehouse. Uh, Thomasville is a showroom. IKEA understands that the young people who are coming in, in, all, in a lot of cases, have children, young families, and things like that. So they offer in-store child care, whereas Thomasville doesn't offer that. However, they have salespeople who are very, very attentive and design services to help you get exactly what you're looking for. Uh, Ikea, you put the stuff together yourself. You take it home, you put it together. Um, Thomasville, it comes assembled. Uh, Ikea is cheap and low quality. Thomasville, you know, the, what they're trying to say is they're they're nice. Uh, Ikea is modern tr you know, tr versus traditional. Ikea is not typically customizable. You go and you pick from the four colors that they have. You put it on your car, and then you drive home and put it together. Thomasville, you order something, you wait four months, and then you get a couch. <laughs> so none of these are, neither one of these is bad. Neither one of them is better than the other, but they're completely different. They've, taken, they've made decisions you know, in not allowing for customization, not worrying too much. Ikea does kind of deliver. Not worrying too much about delivery. Different things like that that are catered to the audience that these people are trying to find a fit with. And in doing so, you know, Ikea, uh, maybe if they had customizable options, maybe if they had some more services around that, they could charge more. Thomasville, maybe they could charge less if they weren't so customizable and attentive to needs. So it's just, it, this is an example of companies that have, have made some compromises, made some tough choices uh, based on who they want to find a fit with, and they've built successful businesses around that. IKEA has meatballs to, too, though, so. Over the top IKEA. Yeah, that's right. So um, let's talk about positioning. So there's, uh, there's a guy in the world named Tim Williams, and uh, he wrote a book called Positioning for Professionals. And we started to get into positioning just a little bit on the last slide. Um, we started talking about positioning just a little bit and the idea of pulling out these things that make you different. And so uh, what Tim Williams says is that most firms uh, or most companies are engaged in fighting turf wars instead of finding new turf. Um, we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, but I think uh, everybody here should probably understands exactly what I'm talking about. So, you know, there's a company that's pretty similar to you. And, you know, you're just trying to sort of compete against them. You know, Mike talked about the 120 agencies in St. Louis. Maybe there's, you know, uh, 10 glove manufacturers, and you all make pretty much the exact same glove. But, uh, you know, um, so ours has this special stitching on the thumb or, you know, these little tiny differences that it takes a lot of attention and energy to sort of get into and understand. So there's not this immediate understanding of difference. So you're really just sort of competing on the same ground as everybody else. Uh, so, but let's talk about how people arrive at that. And what Tim Williams says is that humans learn by copying. So we've got this cool dry cleaning example here. So let's say that Aaron, who's over there, hey Aaron, sorry to point a laser at your face. Uh, Aaron decides he's going to start a dry cleaning company. And so he thinks about, you know, all the shirts and pants he's had dry cleaned before and what it's like to get that stuff done. So, uh, you know, he takes the stuff in, they can do your laundry, they'll clean your shirts, They'll iron them. They'll put whatever kind of starch you want on there. Maybe you can get it done in seven hours. So he thinks, in order to have a dry cleaning business, I need to do the same type of thing because that's what people expect from a dry cleaner. And maybe I'll put a couple drops more starch on my stuff, or maybe I'll do it in six and a half hours, or, you know, the fourth shirt's free. You know, I'll do these little tiny things that are sales incentives that kind of drive down the value of what you're doing, or that these little details that takes so much, t again, time and energy to understand that people really have to read into it. Now, the issue with that is that everybody kind of makes companies the same because they say, here's what a dry cleaner should be. Where that becomes problematic is when companies are so undiscernible from one another, I think that's the word, um, essentially everybody sees them as the same. 
And if you see everything is the same, all you want is the cheapest version of the same thing or the fastest version or whatever it is. I mean, it's a really a race to the bottom, and that bottom is usually the most cost-effective way to get the same thing you can get in a thousand different forms. So let's talk about the power of positioning to change that. So positioning is really the declaration of the fit that you want to find. You know, Michael Porter says you should analyze your business, understand the things that you do differently, understand who you want to, who you want to target. Positioning takes that a step further and starts to translate that into the things that you can use to actually communicate that and to further, further develop that focus. This is a subject that, you know, Atomic Dust has been, uh, Mike and I have been having sit in the same room for a long time, having the same conversation for like the last 15 years. Um, but we've been, we talk about this all the time. And everybody, you know, I, I'm sure that our people who are here in the audience um, have heard us talk about this over and over and over again. But I think it's very, very important. And it's really sort of helped the way that we think about our business. It's helped the way that, that, um, that we work with our clients and help them understand their industries and what they can do. So positioning is really about uh, putting a stake in the ground and saying, here's exactly who we want to be and here's the fit we want and here's our declaration that we're going to go after that. So here's an example that we like to use. And we're going to turn it back to the agency world. So uh, who all, are there a lot of agencies here, people from agencies? No. Aaron, OK. Uh, so uh, we'll put it in the agency context. I think, I think you'll understand the, the example. So um, agencies, can, they can either specialize or they can be what we refer to as generalist firms. So a generalist firm is, in the phone book analogy, is an agency that will work with any client. We'll do business to business work. We'll do business to consumer work. We'll do digital work. We'll do traditional print. We'll do media placement. We'll do PR. We'll do anything a full service agency has ever done for any person or company in the world. And so when it comes time for us to go find new business, to find people that we want to make a connection with and find a fit with, we have the entire phone book to start with. Do you guys remember phone books? Right. They still they dropped them off like, our office the other day. Is this, do people know here? I think they, they're like to level tables out. To tear uh, in half. So the idea, you know, if you're generalist, if you don't have a focus, and this all goes back to the idea of being competitive and having strategy and using positioning to, to give you more leverage. If you don't have a focus, then your audience, the people that you could potentially work with, is the entire phone book. And that is really, really scary to sort of think about. All right, I'm just going to start at the A's and work my way through the phone book. So when you declare a specialty, when you identify who you want to find a fit with, and you know how you're going to go about doing that. So let's say, for instance, and this is not the case, Atomic Dust is a healthcare marketing firm, and we only make websites for pharmaceutical companies. Not let's, true. Right. That's not. We don't. We don't. Yeah. Anyway, it's my example though. Mm -hmm. So the phone book then becomes much much smaller. You you know who your target audience is, and you know the types of conversation you can have with them based on the types of things that you can do for them. So not only does it narrow down your options for who you can do business with, it also allows you to add value to the conversations, add focus to the conversations you're having with them. Ultimately, you find yourself getting more respect from the client because they see you as an expert, because you, you shouldn't just have experience, you should have expertise, by the way. Um, but you can also, again, charge more, charge a premium. Sorry if there are any clients here hearing me say that. So. Let's talk about. Terrified. I know. Get ready for it. Oh. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. We'll get there. So, but when you talk about focusing, for a lot of people, it's kind of a scary thing. You know what? What I've just described is, you know, from our perspective as an agency, we're gonna go from all these people that we could potentially work with to a very small segment. You know, and that's terrifying. A lot of people say, "No." Uh, this Sorry. was the funniest joke in our office for the last two days. So, and the reason that, they, that there's sort of a hesitation to do this is because by jamming that stake in the ground, by saying, here's who we're going to be, here's who we're going to target, people get scared. They say, first off, you know, what do I want to focus on? You know, if my focus is too narrow, will there be enough work there? You know, what do I have to do to really serve that focus and to build a position around that kind of thing? will I get bored working in one area? And what Tim Williams says is that being boxed in is actually a good thing. Look how happy he looks. I know, it's a happy box. 
So what he says is being boxed in is a good thing. It gives you guardrails. It gives you, again, the ability to be more direct, be more focused in the things that you're trying to do and things you're offering for your clients, changes the conversation, changes the prospect list, changes your ability to, to sort of charge and, and the type of work that you can do for people. So another example is, uh, and we won't go into too much detail about him, there's this uh, consultant based out of Nashville named David Baker. He works with uh, you know, small and mid-sized agencies and some other companies as well, really helping them sort of understand um, positioning. And, and you know, the thing is, all these guys, they all kind of say the same thing anyway. They just um, they say it a little bit different way. But David's analogy is that uh, if you think about yourself as a company who will do anything for anyone, you're in a room full of doors. And the exciting part about those doors is that they can go anywhere. You know, you can walk through any door. And you can do work with somebody, you can come back into your big room, you can go through a different door that's completely different kind of work. As long as you say you're willing to do it, that's great. So people's fear is that if they walk through one door and say, we're going to go into this room and we're going to stay in this room, is again, that they'll be limited. They don't know which door to walk through. They're afraid they'll get bored. They don't know if it's the right, if there's going to be enough business in that. And the reality is, and we can attest to this, that if you walk through a specific door, you're in a room with more doors. You're not just locked in a room with no doors and no windows. Everybody knows what a door is, right? Um, so yeah, so the idea is, but the doors in this room are different. You know, the doors are specific to the focus. You know, they're specific to the door that you just walked through. And, you know, I guess my just take on this is that don't be afraid to focus because you'll find a lot more freedom and a lot more options once you commit to doing that than you think are possible now. So again, you know, more focus leads to more expertise, and that leads to um, you know driving value and changing the conversation with people. So Magical. position. I know this is a good-looking book. Uh, I'd like to read that. Um, so <laughs> again, <laughs> we're uh, we're talking about the idea of, of positioning, and, and you know, another way to think about positioning, and, and you know, Tim Williams says this, and we we subscribe to this. It's the story your company has to tell about itself. And that story should embody all the, all the fits you're looking for, all the value that you, that you bring to your clients in that. And that story should really become the strategy. It should sit at the heart of everything you do and really be the foundation to drive any sort of execution, any kind of thinking, any kind of innovation, whatever it is that comes from that. We'll talk about um, this a little bit more, but um, that story, that positioning... Um, also shapes the culture, which is where we get into the concept of design. I don't want you to think, you know, a lot of people, I, I guess I don't know what you think. A lot of people, when they, they talk about positioning, um, again, they think of it as language. They think of it as uh, like elevator pitch, you know, taglines, uh, mission statements, and things like that. But positioning is about the whole world, right? Positioning is about all of that language. It's about how it, how it fits in with the, the visual brand, how it fits in with the creative, how, it, you know, how design plays into all these things. It's all about the experience that you're creating for your customers and all of those things play together. Mike's going to talk a little bit more, uh, more about design and culture in just a minute, but a couple quick examples. So uh, again, the Michael Porter example was about companies who had made some decisions to sort of change the way that they behaved and then built businesses around that. So this is an example of companies that uh, don't change anything, um, but have built, so it's sort of a pure positioning example. We've got two. So Walmart and Target. You guys may have heard of, of Target, but probably not Walmart. So <laughs> if you look at these two brands, Walmart is save money, live better. So how cheap can you get? How low can you go is everything that drives Walmart. Target is more about lifestyle. Thing is, these they offer like 98% of the exact same stuff at price points that are very, very similar. But they position themselves around that much more, much differently. Much more different. I don't know if that's the word. So again, we see another example. Walmart, save money, live better. And you everything that's in the store is, you know, you've got prices. I could use my laser pointer, but I'm not. Uh, the price is everywhere, and it's all about, you know, they used to have the smiling faces, and it was watch out for falling prices, and it's all these cheap things. And when you think about the culture that comes from that, you know, it's a horrible, horrible company that pays its employees nothing. You know, nobody likes to work there. When you think about Target, though, it's more about lifestyle. Same stuff. But Target's not about how low can the prices get. It's about how can the Target world and the Target culture connect to your lifestyle. And so it's, it, it's you know, things that are pretty much the same that have been positioned completely differently. Another example that we like to use around the office is Tylenol. Um, so it's acetaminophen, right? And there's lots of different versions of this. So quickly we see white, yellow, red, pills, dosages. Oops. 
where do I point this? Here's another example. Here's Walmart's version. White, yellow, red, threw in some blue, pills, dosages, Rite Aid. White, yellow, red, blue. They look the same, blurry. Yeah, these are pretty low res. Uh, you know, smart sense. I don't know where that's from. We didn't take these photos, by the way. Um, but so, I mean, a quick comment. This isn't a bad strategy, right? It's, you know, here's Tylenol's the brand you trust. Uh, it's the one that's, that's the most tested and so on and so forth. So we should look like them. We should build familiarity into our presentation so that people understand that we're the same as this thing next to it. But we're going to compete with them on price. Generics exist uh, to compete on price. So here's this helpline from Walgreens. So it's the exact same product. They haven't done anything to reinvent Tylenol or to reinvent acetaminophen. But what they've done is they've reinvented sort of the packaging and the experience around it. These are very visual examples, but they're all about positioning. It's sort of attitude also. So the package is a different shape. It's different materials, sort of this cardboard kind of puffy pack thing. They immediately connect it to the reason that you went there in the first place to buy it. I've got a headache. You know, so it's, it's just, it's in language that tries to connect to pain points and physical pain in this case. And it's presented in a completely different way. So if we look at the other example, we see the whole line of things. It's sort of turning that industry around and in what you can expect from the exact same thing that hundreds of other companies are doing. And I guarantee they can charge more than what the other generics do. So that's an example of positioning at work and how, how companies have not really changed anything about the products or anything like that, but they've taken things that they can do with their positioning, with their brand, identified pieces that are unique in the industry, and they're articulating that through design and, and through attitude and, and different types of things within the brand. That leads us to something that Mike's going to talk about. So it sounds really simple. Like we've, I've, oh, I mean, I've probably read six books on competition and positioning and strategy. And really, it's like essentially do something different than your competitors. But Neumeier, uh, Marty Neumeier, you guys ever read any Marty Neumeier? Awesome books about, he's written um, The Brand Gap and Zag and The Designful Company and The Brand Flip and 46 Rules of Genius and uh, a couple others. Anyway, uh, smart guy. But he says the central problem of brand building is getting a complex organization to execute a simple idea. So these ideas are very simple, but he talks really, his focus is kind of about culture and how to actually get things done. So when he talks about competition, he frames it as the barriers to competition. So what are these things that are obstacles that we can put in front of competitors that makes us harder to compete with? <coughs> uh, he says that, and I don't know if I believe him, but he said that things used to be handmade. And that means people would make things by hand and then they would sell them. And then eventually someone got the idea that if they could build a factory uh, and make things faster and cheaper and regulated, it's so bright over here, uh, he, these, these companies would have this giant barrier to competition. They would be harder to follow. And eventually as factories caught on, uh, access to capital became very important because if you were a company and you can get a loan, you can build a bigger factory or better factory. Uh, and then the idea of patents came in. So if you can own the technology to make the product or own the technology to build a factory, uh, that is a hard thing for your competitor to deal with and you would, you would kind of shut them down. And he says that over the last 20 years, as products have become uh, less physical and more digital, the patent barrier is really showing some cracks because people just sort of license each other's technology or sue each other to death. <clears throat> so he says, oh, look how... Uh, faded is. Uh, he says the, the new barrier to competition are brands. So he describes a brand is uh, that in, in everybody's head, uh, when you, there's little boxes and they're filled with categories. So if you say the word phone, some of you think of iPhone and some of you think of Android. And to offset that thinking and to change your opinion uh, is a lot of work. But that's this barrier that, that, uh, that is hard to follow. And Jesse would actually say football phone. Seriously, that's what I think of. <laughs> Time life. Uh, so branding is the new barrier to competition, according to Neumeier. And I personally think so is user experience. Uh, and I don't mean that as a buzzword about website design. I mean it that as products become more digital, uh, the ease of use and the understanding of what they are, I think, will help uh, uh, ex essentially sell them. We work with a lot of brands that just try to simplify things and, and streamline processes, and I, we think it's going to be a very competitive space. 
Uh, so when you talk about brands, a brand isn't what you say it is, it's what they say it is. This is like a classic Neumeyer quote. Uh, I'll just call him Uncle Marty, if that's okay. Uh, so brand isn't what you say it is, it's what they say it is. So some people uh, say, well, I don't have a brand or I don't have like a, uh, an identity. And the truth is that that everyone does. They just might be uh, accidental brands. Like you've never really tried to steer it in any direction. It just kind of lives in the world and people already have an opinion because here's my favorite slide. A brand is a person's gut feeling about a product or service. This woman is in pain. Uh, so, but that's the thing. Like it's, it's how someone feels about a product or service. And brands can be, design and branding is one of these uh, industries where everyone has their own interpretation of what design and branding is, or its own definition. But Neumeier says a, a, it's a person's gut feeling about a product or service. So they've used your product, and they've already made up their mind if they like it or not, or how they feel about it. Uh, there are more brands than ever, and everyone's competing for that category and that space in, in the mind. And he says that with all this competition and people sort of copying each other, <clears throat> Advantage isn't a product or a business model, since that can be copied over time. It's culture. <clears throat> uh, so it's really like, if, as things change, can you build a culture that can roll with the punches? And uh, another cliche, I think, I think Amazon is probably the most innovative uh, company in, in, in products ever, and everyone just kind of steals from them, and I don't think they get any credit. Uh, but he says that the idea is you need to build a culture of innovation. I hate the word innovation because it's been beaten to death by businesses and entrepreneurs. And Neumeier, I think, means it in the most purest sort of uh, spirit. And uh, he started this idea of culture of innovation about 10 years ago. So his idea or his concept is that with innovation and in trying to build a culture, there's this gap that most companies face between the vision of what could be and the reality of what is. And really, uh, he calls it the dragon gap. So the space between vision and reality, and this unknown in between. He calls it the dragon gap because early, uh, before the world was explored, old um, map makers would, would fill in you know, everything they knew about the world. Here's the ocean, here's the land, and all the places that were unexplored, they would label, here be dragons. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, some people would avoid those places. But he talks about that sort of the dragon gap, this unexplored territory and business uh, where no one's ever really been before. And he says that st companies say, has this ever been done before? And some people in Dragon Gaps will say, no, that's the beauty. And others will say, no, that's the danger. And it, it's this, this gap of difference of opinion and sort of risk that uh, sort of makes companies not innovative, kind of complacent. So again, build a culture of innovation. The secret is culture. Um, sliding. He's got this line, <coughs> if you want to innovate, you got to design. He says, got to. I think it's, I think it's cool. Uh, so if you want to innovate, you got to design. But what, uh, so I think he's talking about you, you have to figure out how to get there and, and continually work and edit to try to make, to close this gap. He says the other gap in business is that strategy and creativity in a lot of businesses couldn't be further apart. And a lot of times, Creativity is not at the same table as strategy. And it just sort of, uh, especially with larger businesses, there's red tape. The people that are down you know, with the customers uh, have ideas, but they don't bring them up, or they're not well received. And there's just this big gap in sort of culture uh, in business. <clears throat> so he sa Marty Neumeier says design closes that gap, right? But when he says design, he doesn't mean graphic design. He doesn't mean a new website. He doesn't mean uh, the arrangement of artifacts or anything you can even really look at. Uh, he defines design in as a designer as <clears throat> anyone who could change the current situation into a more favorable one. And this is really my favorite definition of design because I always work with people and we show work and they're like, well, I'm not a designer, but you know, then they, but it's just like this qualifier saying, well, I don't, I'm not a, but everyone, you know, has an opinion and is creative and has ideas. And I think uh, in businesses, people need, need more of that. So in his definition, even the CEO is a designer. This is actually a client. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's like the meanest looking person I could find. But it's, it's the idea that uh, it's not just design and creativity isn't someone's job, right? It's sort of, it's the job of this culture to push things forward. 
<clears throat> so I think this is interesting. You guys may think it's boring. <clears throat> Marty does all these workshops, and he talks to CEOs, and he talks about uh, what's their goal, right? And most of them say profit or value. Like, oh, we're, you know, of course, we're trying to drive value for shareholders. And he says, well, what drives value? And they say, well, growth, you know, to, to you know, get bigger and have more stuff. And uh, he says, well, what drives growth? And he says, innovation. You know, we're going to invent new products and new services and make ours faster and and better, and then he says, well, what drives innovation? And most people pause because they don't have an answer for that. So Mar Marty says the answer is culture, and that what drives culture is vision. So it's this idea that a company with vision can build a culture that's innovative and drive growth and change and value. And I think Amazon is like a really great example of that. Uh, so vision isn't this financial investment. It isn't this thing you could buy from like uh, anyone, really. Uh, it's a strategic one. It's a decision to say we value these things and we should have these conversations. Everyone should know where they're going and why. Uh, Uber versus taxis. Who here loves Uber, hates Uber? No, yeah, no, nothing? Two? Either way, just answer both. <coughs> okay, regardless how you feel, and, it, and I'm, not <coughs> I'm not pro or against, so we try to keep these things separately, but I think Uber has this, this culture that sort of breaks the mold, right? And, you know, love them or hate them. The, but the way they do it is they make conscious trade-offs and decisions, uh, and then they have this constant culture to just make decisions that are in line with that. So, with Uber, you can order via an app. With traditional cabs, you call them or you flag them down, and some have apps, depending on what city you're in. Uber drivers own the car, so they tend to be, like, cleaner and nicer. Uh, drivers rent cabs, uh, which is you know, rented cab. Uber's usually nicer cars. Cabs kind of feel public. You know, it's hard to not have bias or give opinion, but if you've ever been in some cabs, you're like, where, where, who's been here before? What, what am I sitting in? Uh, Uber's kind of known for friendly drivers. Uh, cabs, you know, uh, there's been some really friendly cab drivers in St. Louis, but other parts of the world, not so much. Uh, Uber, you can look up your reviews of your driver and leave reviews, right? And it's kind of cool. Like, what a little breakthrough idea that you know, because I would complain, have you ever been to New York in a, in a cab? It's like an insane death race. Uh, but it would be love, I'd love to give that guy a half star. <laughs> uh, although he got me to the airport. Uh, but with, with taxi cabs, you don't know your driver, You'll, you don't, there's no sort of connection. Uh, Uber, you pay via the app. Uh, taxi cabs, you could pay with cash or credit cards, and some have apps. Uh, but the Uber, it's just one experience. Uber tips are included, cabs, tips are expected. Uh, Uber, you could track the driver and where they are and how far away they are. With uh, cabs, you usually just get an estimated window of time. We'll be there between blah, 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 and, you know, uh, and the question is, will they show up? And uh, they do, but, you know, it's just this mystery, uh, and it makes people nervous. But, so when Uber comes into town, they say, no, you're breaking the rules. You know, that's not fair. We, we, that's not how cabs run. You know, we get people to A to B. Well, they've they took the idea of getting people to A to B, and they just rethought it. You know, and they continue to rethink it. And when they get, and they're also willing to operate illegally, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. So you can call, you can get an Uber in St. Louis, although it's, it's still illegal, I think, right? Uh, but it's a culture saying we're fine to break the rules. I'm not saying everyone should be illegal. I'm saying that, uh, but that's a decision they made, not from one guy, but from a whole team saying, let's do it. Uh, so, things we learned so far. So we just went through a lot of stuff, and maybe it was dense, maybe it was not dense, but we're going to have the quickest wrap-up you've ever seen in your entire life. Uh, so I want to kind of recap three key things um, from this, and then we're going to end a, a little bit differently than I think we <clears throat> do in a lot of our presentations. So again, I, I, we've kind of tried to frame this in the context of the three different people that we've, we've talked about. Um, so overall, I think it's sort of important to note, the thing we can learn from this, is that companies want to be more competitive. They don't always use those terms, you know, but they, they're ultimately trying to be more competitive. But companies don't necessarily understand how they should compete. They don't understand um, the way they should view competition and the way that they can sort of change their company based on changing that view. Companies tend to also not understand that a unique focus position can change the way that they're compared or more importantly contrasted uh, to their competition. And that, you know, glaringly, companies don't have a culture that moves design up the ladder 
from the creative department to decision makers. So what that leads to is this continual investment in short-term magic bullets like Mike talked about instead of long-term strategies and culture. Uh, now, again, what we, a lot, in a lot of cases, we tend to kind of get prescriptive at the end of these and say, now, in order to do it for yourself, here's some steps that you can go through. So we don't really have that. I think, you know, people have heard that. We can talk about it if you want to hear it. But I think a couple things to note. Um, Mike hates the term innovation, so do I. I hate the term disruptive, but it's on the screen, so I'll read it. So, uh, you know, it's important to note that a change in any industry uh, is never incremental. It's disruptive. So I like the concept of that. And so what we'll sort of leave with today is, is we'd like you to ask yourself a couple questions. You know, how can I bring something completely new into my market? And how would it look if I were to do the opposite of what everyone else is doing? I think it's a really great starting point if you are considering doing this for yourself or for a client to really sort of say, you know, what are, you know, where are the, where are the dragon gaps? You know, what are the things that haven't been done? And are they a good fit for us? Are they a good fit for our customers? Do they add value to what we can bring people? And if so, then, then you work backwards from that and say, all right, how can my company move into those? How can my company turn into that to then be seen as different? That, that all goes back to the important part of this is we, we tie everything back to the, to the beginning of competition and positioning, how design factors into all that. But I mean, it's, it's all about a process, understanding that, making that uh, a part of everything you do every day, and really building that into your culture. So these are, I think, a couple questions that we can kind of leave you with. And then with that, oh, Mike. Uh, just for the egotist comment, for the record, we do make several different kinds of logos. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.